Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to uh, Paralyzed Veterans of America's uh, webinar commemorating the Americans with Disabilities Act anniversary um, on ADA enforcement. Uh, we're going to give folks just a, a moment or two to log in, and then we will get started. We'll be back with you in just a moment. Well, good afternoon once again. My name is Heather Ansley, and I'm the Associate Executive Director of Government Relations for Paralyzed Veterans of America. And we want to welcome you to today's webinar on ADA enforcement um, at the state and local levels. Uh, we have an exciting program for you today. Before we get started, we just want to remind everyone about our process for today. So first, the webinar is being recorded. Um, and it will be available for viewing on pbas.org website. And uh, if you registered for today's event, um, then you will receive an email alerting you when that uh, webinar has been posted. We also typically do post the PowerPoint presentation as well. Uh, we do have closed captioning available for today's webinar. And if you need to access that, you can click the CC button in the meetings control bar that's at the bottom of your screen to turn that on. Finally, um, we will have an opportunity at the end of the uh, webinar to answer uh, some questions. So if you do have any questions throughout the presentation, we ask that you use the Q&A box um, that is in your control panel to ask those um, instead of the chat box. Um, so now we will begin and I'm gonna turn it over to Susan Prokop who is our National Advocacy Director. Susan. Hello everyone, uh, good afternoon or good morning depending on where you're patching into this. I wanna welcome you to the webinar and uh, I'm gonna do some introductions of all of our participant panelists today and run through uh, the agenda that you see on the screen there. Um, we're gonna start out with a broad overview of state and local ADA enforcement uh, with uh, Carlene Crespo with the ADA Mid-Atlantic Center and then follow on with a panel of uh, some of our national advocacy staff as well as a couple of PVA leaders who have done some advocacy at the local and state levels. Um, but first, two introductions. I want to introduce Carlene Crespo, who is an ADA information specialist for the Mid-Atlantic ADA Center. Uh, she provides training and technical assistance on the ADA and other relevant laws to government agencies, businesses, people with disabilities, and others within the Mid-Atlantic region. She's been with the ADA Center for over seven years and previously worked with young children with disabilities through the ARC of Montgomery County. My colleague Lee Page is PVA's Senior Associate Advocacy Director and has shepherded PVA's ADA advocacy work since passage of the law in 1990. In addition to working with Congress and federal agencies on ADA enforcement issues, Lee has been part of several legal actions brought by PBA to ensure compliance with the law. Ann Robinson is a PVA National Director from Texas, medically retired from the Army with a spinal cord injury in 1999. She became involved with the Texas chapter, serving in many roles from advocacy director to president, and she and her husband and their children live in San Antonio, Texas. Tom Wheaton is PVA's National Treasurer. A Navy veteran, Tom has been an active member of PVA since sustaining a spinal cord injury in the service in the late 1980s. 
He has served as a leader with the Minnesota and Mountain States chapters. And for the past 24 years, he has served on PVA's executive committee in various capacities. He and his wife, Angela, and their children live in Colorado. And now I am going to relinquish the microphone for our speaker, Carlene. So uh, take it away, Carlene, and tell us about ADA enforcement at the state and local levels. Okay, thank you so much, Susan. Um, so as she said, my name is Carlene. I am with the Mid-Atlantic ADA Center. Uh, we are an information and training center on the Americans with Disabilities Act. So we do not have lawyers or advocates and we cannot give legal advice. So, um, but we can give you guidance on where you need to go to get uh, enforcement. Um, so to start out, next slide, please. Just a little bit of what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna talk about um, titles two, three, and four of the ADA and how enforcement works under those titles. Uh, we're not gonna talk about title one today, that's employment. And I think much of the discussion today is, is going to be about you know, places open to the general public. Um, and then we'll also talk about um, some other, other options besides your standard enforcement. Um, so as many of you have probably found, one of the challenges of the ADA is that there aren't ADA police. You know, there isn't somebody that you can pick up the phone and call and say, there is an ADA violation here. You know, they didn't provide an interpreter or, um, you know, with accessible parking, you might be able to call the police and say, there's someone without an accessible tag parked in this parking space. Sometimes they do something about it. Sometimes they don't. <laughs> so it's hit or miss, it can depend. Um, but again, there's not really one just central place that you can call and say, you know, come out, we need help. Um, so one thing to remember about the Americans with Disabilities Act is that it is a federal law and it is enforced by federal agencies. So um, any violation that you have, any issue with accessibility or compliance, you know, at a state or local level, you still have to go through the administrative process in the law itself, which means you're gonna to have to go through a federal agency. And different agencies enforce different parts of the ADA. Um, so on the next slide, slide seven, a little bit about Title II of the ADA. Um, Title II covers all programs, all, we're talking all programs, services and activities of state and local government entities, which are also called public entities. So everything from law enforcement and corrections, uh, courts, schools, you know, the public school system, social services, um, and, and then the physical areas that are maintained by state and local government. So your public right of way, um, traffic stops, street parking, all of those areas. Title II covers all of that. Um, so on the next slide, um, so what do you do if you have an issue under Title II? Uh, let's say you're in a court case and you're deaf and they didn't provide an interpreter even though you requested one, um, something like that. Well, the first thing that you wanna do under Title II is find out whether or not there's somebody called an ADA coordinator. Um, under Title II of the ADA, there is a requirement that all public entities, so again, corrections, law enforcement, schools, et cetera, with 50 or more employees must have an ADA grievance procedure available. <clears throat> so that means they have to have posted um, somewhere on their website or in their materials, they have to have 
created a policy or procedure regarding filing a complaint um, for ADA related issues. And then they have to appoint a representative who handles those grievances and manages the, the grievance procedure. So on the next slide. Um, that ADA complaint or point person is a Title II or an ADA coordinator. They are responsible for coordinating efforts of the government entity to comply with Title II and investigate any complaints. Well, one of the challenges with ADA coordinators is how to find them. Um, rarely, it, it's becoming more common now, but often you're not going to hear them called ADA coordinator. They could be disability services. They could be some other um, type of position, you know, maybe somebody who handles facility maintenance, that sort of thing. And that ADA coordinator role is combined in there. And so they don't, they aren't conveniently called ADA coordinators. You, you often have to dig a little bit and see if you can find somebody who handles that grievance procedure. Generally, your larger cities or counties, you know, the city of Philadelphia, for example, is going to have all of this information pretty readily available, easy to find on their website. And so you can find out who their ADA coordinator is. And so that would be the first thing, that would be the first person that you would want to try to contact if you had a complaint about something that was managed by state and local government. Um, you could go past them, but something you really wanna keep in mind is that the federal agencies look at whether or not you try local options first. That is important. So you really do wanna to try to find that person and go through them and see if it can be resolved at that level first. Um, also keep in mind, they don't handle anything to do with public businesses, you know, Title III places of public accommodation. Um, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, on the next slide, please. So under Title II, um, you are going to want to go to, you know, if you're going to go to the federal level, you're going to put in your complaint with um, the Department of Justice, the Civil Rights Office, but if it is transportation related, transportation is like a mini ADA within the ADA. Um, and the requirements and enforcement are actually handled by the Federal Transit Administration. So if you've got issues with um, paratransit, that's who you're actually going to go through uh, under Title II at the federal level. Um, and on slide 11, for anything else, um, including private transportation providers, so you're talking your general taxi service, that's going to be um, enforced by the US Department of Justice Civil Rights Division. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, but again, for both the transportation complaints or other complaints, you can go through that ADA coordinator first for both of those. But if you want to also step it up and go to the federal enforcement agency, that's that's how it works. It's split between those two. <clears throat> Excuse me. So on slide 12, next slide, please. A little bit about Title III. Title III covers private businesses. So your places of public accommodation. There are 12 types of private businesses, and it is an all-inclusive list. So it doesn't include anything that is not in those 12 categories. Um, it also includes private businesses that offer courses and tests. And it covers commercial facilities with regard to the initial construction. They have to follow the ADA 2010 standards for accessible design. And then um, if they have any areas there that are open to the general public, let's say it's a Pepsi factory and they have a section where they offer tours that is then going to be covered by Title III. Next slide, please. 
Um, so with regard to enforcement, there really isn't anybody at the local level who enforces the ADA um, when it comes to Title III. There isn't an ADA coordinator. There's not a go-between person, which can be a little challenging and a little frustrating. Um, so we'll talk about other options in just a minute. But um, <clears throat> at least if you are going to try to file a complaint under Title III of the ADA specifically, you've got to go through the Department of Justice, um, Office of Civil Rights. There's no specific deadline to file, which is nice. Um, or um, you can sometimes go through the Attorney General's office if there is a work share agreement between the State Attorney General's office and the Department of Justice which does occasionally happen, but it isn't for every state, but sometimes the state level will kind of take some of the, um, the weight off of the federal agency a little bit. Um, but again, that's not a guaranteed route, but you can try that. Um, next slide, please. Under both Title II and Title III, you do have the option of filing a private lawsuit. This is not an option for everybody, um, but individuals or groups may file a private lawsuit. And um, unlike some of the other parts of the ADA, there's no administrative complaint um, process required. You don't have to go through steps until you can use a private lawyer. Um, so again, it is an option. Um, next slide, please. So at the state and local level, um, as I said, when we got started, the Americans with Disabilities Act is a federal law and enforced by federal agencies. So state level agencies generally do not enforce the ADA. However, there are state and local laws that mirror the ADA you know, most states have a human rights law um, that the state follows in addition to the federal ADA. So you really want to investigate and find out, you know, if your state or local government, counties even have civil rights laws that protect the rights of individuals with disabilities. Um, and so you can look into this option um, you know, that in each state, there's going to be an office that enforces um, human rights or civil rights, but um, they don't have, they don't all have the same name. Uh, in Maryland, it's the Maryland Commission on Civil Rights. For Pennsylvania, it's um, uh, PHRC, the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission, um, but you can find those and check into those and see if there are any state level laws, like I said, that mirror the ADA um, that would allow you to address the issues that you're having. And you can do that at the same time as filing a complaint with the federal agency for the Americans with Disabilities Act. You know, there's nothing that says you can't do all of these at one time. Um, you know, and at the local level, you're more likely to get a little bit faster uh, turnaround than if you go through the federal agency. And uh, on the next slide, please. Just gonna talk briefly about Title IV because telecommunications do come up. Um, providers of telephone voice transmission services um, must provide relay, functionally equivalent relay services for people with hearing or speech disabilities. Um, so that's, you know, your phone services. And so on the next slide, slide 17. So if you're going to file a complaint uh, for one of those issues, you have to go to the FCC. You have to go to the Federal Communications Commission through their Disability Rights Office 
um, to file a complaint. So you wouldn't want to go through DOJ or one of the, um, you know, often what happens with DOJ is that it will filter through them and then they'll just trade it over to one of the other federal agencies anyway. So you could, you could do it through the Department of Justice, but there'll be delay and they're going to pin it over to the FCC anyway. Um, on the next slide, please. So one thing to remember is that when you're talking about federal enforcement, when you're talking about federal agencies, um, let's say you've got uh, a university that receives significant federal funding um, and they're covered by, um, they're gonna be covered by the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 um, or, you know, uh, federal agencies in general. So if you, if it's the Department of Defense or uh, a VA hospital, something like that, and there is an accessibility issue, it is actually not an ADA issue. It's not gonna be covered by the Americans with Disabilities Act. So you can't go that route to file a complaint. Um, the, you know, the Rehab Act came before the ADA and so it covers those issues. Um, and so often what you, what you wanna do is try to find the Office of Civil Rights within the individual agency that covers whatever program or service you are trying to access and um, do their grievance, you know, their complaint procedure. And on the next slide, uh, we strongly encourage people because it can be really difficult to wait on these enforcement options to work. Uh, they do take time and there are many people probably ahead of you with issues and complaints. So we do strongly suggest that you contact disability advocacy organizations such as Centers for Independent Living um, and in, at a local or a national level, um, there is the state, you know, Office of Aging and Disability, um, you know, organizations like American Federation of the Blind, things like that, and see if you can get some support in trying to, to make those changes because uh, particularly for the Title III type issues, you're not really going to find that kind of one-on-one -on -one, uh, correction or enforcement um, regarding a particular issue that you're having. Um, and that is a quick rundown on enforcement options under the ADA. So hopefully all of that is clear and made sense to folks. And I'm gonna hand it back to Susan. Okie dokie. Thank you, Carlene for that very thorough review of ADA enforcement and uh, the different uh, components of that uh, process. Uh, it can be a little co complicated. We're gonna move into a panel discussion uh, now covering some of the ADA advocacy efforts that have been undertaken by National PVA, along with some testimony from PVA leaders about their own advocacy experiences at the state and community levels. Lee and I are going to go over some highlights of Nationals ADA advocacy over the years. And uh, then Anne is gonna go through the Texas chapter's uh, successful passage of, uh, of a state law chain, uh, change related to accessible parking spaces, which may have some application to uh, other chapters, some of the lessons they may apply in their own states. And then Tom is going to outline what we describe as kind of a carrot versus a stick approach to encouraging compliance with the law. And uh, Sometimes all it takes is highlighting the good guys to make other people take notice and follow suit. But uh, first, uh, I'll just say as part of government relations, PVA's advocacy program works with a number of other PVA departments to support and advance compliance with the ADA. As Lee will outline in a moment, 
advocacy has coordinated with our general counsel's office on several legal actions against various Title II and Title III entities. Advocacy staff have also worked with a variety of government and private sector boards and commissions focused on the ADA, such as the US Access Board and Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines Disability Advisory Board. Before turning the mic over to Lee, I did wanna share a few additional details about PVA's architecture and accessible design program with which advocacy has collaborated over the years because of its particular relevance to today's topic. Architecture led by Mark Lichter, direct, uh, the director, addresses ADA compliance in a variety of ways, including providing technical assistance to architects, developers, building owners on ADA compliance and accessible design recommendations. They also advise PVA chapters and individual PVA members about advocating for accessibility in their communities, examples of which include recent uh, work on Pocahontas State Park in Chesterfield, Virginia, the Virginia Governor's Mansion in Richmond, um, the St. Louis, St. Louis County Courts in Clayton, Missouri, uh, Spellerberg Aquatic Center in the city of uh, Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Architecture also offers workshops on accessible design that include ADA application and compliance uh, to uh, provides that to city entities such as the New York Department of Parks and Recreation. They also serve on building code committees and advisory boards that write the standards and guidelines for buildings and access. And you can learn more about PVA's architecture program under the find support link on our webpage. Uh, that's pva.org research resources and accessible design. So now I'm gonna let my colleague Lee talk a little bit about all of these legal activities we've done over the years and talk a little bit about some emerging issues that we're grappling with at the moment. So it's all yours, Lee. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Susan. Um, listening to Carlene talk just a minute ago, um, given her description of ADA enforcement um, was quite uh, timely and accurate as, uh, as to what I'm going to describe, uh, the early lawsuits that PVA filed to basically enforce the ADA. Uh, as you know, ADA passed in 1990. Uh, the rules and regulations were put out uh, by the Access Board and adopted by the departments in 1992. And, um, and PVA as a national organization uh, decided uh, that we had to act uh, to enforce the law because uh, immediately, uh, especially in the construction area, uh, challenges were being uh, presented and uh, <clears throat> they were not uh, abiding by the law. Uh, the first one I wanna talk about is PVA versus uh, uh, MCI or Ellerby Beckett. Uh, this is night in the early 1990s, and Abe Poland uh, was the owner of the Washington Wizards and the Washington Capitals, uh, the professional hockey team and uh, pro basketball team here in the dis in the Washington D.C. area. He was in the process of moving his teams from Maryland to downtown Washington D.C., and he was building a brand new arena. Um, and so when the rules were passed in 92, they had specific guidelines of what the interior of uh, arenas had to look like in order to accommodate people with disabilities uh, in a seating arrangement. Um, and Mr. Poland had gotten advice from his architects and accessibility specialists, and he completely disregarded them uh, and decided he wanted to build a 25,000 seat arena which did not have access. So uh, we tried to negotiate with him about his pl design plans and uh, it ended up coming to a head where PVA filed a lawsuit as a national organization with four individual named plaintiffs, which I was one of those plaintiffs. 
And um, it was in reference to line of sight over standing spectators was the issue that we uh, filed the lawsuit on or comparable site, sight lines. And, and to demonstrate that, um, uh, a person in a wheelchair could be sitting at the, you know, before ADA, accessible seats in an arena were the last row. And so I would go to a, a concert or a basketball game, as Tom knows real well, I see him shaking his head, and would sit on the back row. And as soon as an exciting play would happen, everyone would stand up in front of me. And all I could see is the person in front of me's backside. So needless to say, after paying all that type of money, that's not the seat I want. So um, we filed suit. Uh, uh, you know, Ellerby Beckett were the architects. Uh, line of sight was the issue. This was uh, this case was filed under Title III of the ADA, um, and uh, we went to court and 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 was held. It was held in our. It was we won the case, um, which was great. It it established a precedent uh, for line of sight, uh, the enforcement of ADA, and um, and the best part about it is it became a nationally recognized case, uh, and then all uh, future basketball arenas or or stadiums that were you know in the pipeline to be constructed. Uh, uh, went ahead and complied with the design guidelines uh, for the ADA. Uh, the downtown arena is now called, uh, it was called Verizon Center. It's now called, I think, Capital One Arena. Um, and it has three or four different configurations where, um, you know, you're sitting for a concert, like music concert, or for basketball, or for hockey. Uh, you know, this was an issue where you know, the court sided with us. We asked for an injunction to stop construction. Uh, the court did not uh, deny the injunction. So, uh, you know, what ended up happening was uh, the the stadium was being built, uh, and at the at the end of the lawsuit, we won. And so, what happened was they had to retrofit accessible seating into the stadium design. So um, it was a big win for PVA uh, as a law, as trying to enforce the law, and, and then uh, the stadium had to make that compliance. Uh, the second case I want to bring to your attention, uh, it was filed uh, 10 years later in 2007 by our Michigan chapter, Michigan PVA, against the University of Michigan. And as uh, Carlene mentioned earlier, this is a Title II case under uh, uh, not public accommodations, but under um, uh, uh, state and local issues and under section 504. Uh, the University of Michigan is part of the state uh, public school system. Uh, in 2007, uh, they were going to renovate the University of Michigan's football stadium. Uh, that stadium, uh, you know, was built in 1927. It's the third largest uh, stadium uh, in the world for uh, seated customers. It had over 107,000 seats to view a University of Michigan football game. Uh, at the time, uh, they were planning to make renovations and expand the stadium uh, to have uh, larger capacity seating, skyboxes, uh, more uh, modern amenities. Uh, the problem was there's only a single point of entry to go into that stadium. Uh, and as a result, our Michigan chapter filed lawsuit. Um, our architectural department from the national office worked uh, alongside with our Michigan chapter. And as a result, um, in 2008, they came to an agreement uh, with the university to uh, provide wheelchair accessible seating uh, in a dispersed uh, seating with uh, accessible line of sight, which uh, reduced their original plans of expansion uh, to um, you know, have a fully compliant stadium with accessible seating for people with wheelchairs. So, and that project was completed uh, in 2009. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, in the 2010 season four football is when the stadium reopened. Um, 
PVA architects have, uh, as you know, what's so funny is between the MCI case and the University of Michigan case, our architecture department has been proactively working with other uh, sports arenas, uh, you know, the Washington Nationals baseball stadium, uh, the new Minnesota Viking stadium up in uh, Minnesota, and a whole host of others uh, that they actively are called upon to do uh, as accessible experts. Uh, so that's been, that's been great uh, for ADA compliance uh, in that arena. Uh, as we look to the future, uh, some of the issues uh, that our members face, um, uh, problems in uh, barriers we see in hotels. Uh, the hotel industry is wide, you know, across the entire country. Uh, you have small mom and pop, uh, small mom and pop hotels, all the way to big conglomerate uh, business hotels, uh, you know. And what we find are there are some aspects of compliance, basically where each hotel has what they de design designate as a wheelchair accessible room in, in cases with a roll in shower, uh, but in a path of travel uh, from the parking lot to the front desk to elevators to the room. But the other issues we find now specifically are in those accessible rooms, uh, bed heights are, are too tall for an independent transfer out of a wheelchair. Um, you've got beds that sit on platforms in some instances. So uh, a person who may need to transfer with um, um, a Hoyer lift cannot make that type of transfer uh, with or without assistance. Uh, reach ranges to heat and air, uh, air conditioning, uh, the controls are too high or too low. Uh, and then other instances we find, uh, you know, door handles don't meet ADA compliance. And then the biggest issue, um, one of the biggest issues is it's a wheelchair accessible room and yet there's so much furniture in the room, the wheelchair can't really uh, maneuver the room. Um, and then the other big issue is uh, convention hotels that uh, organizations who wanna do um, uh, conventions, uh, that host people with disabilities or affect people with disabilities, we find that uh, when you're booking the rooms beyond the accessible rooms, uh, they've got regular hotel rooms that have uh, no longer have um, tubs, yet they've got step-in showers that have one step to step in, which makes it tough for a wheelchair person to you know, transfer from a wheelchair into a shower bench, which conventionally we had done in the past uh, with a tub or uh, basically getting hotels to remove doors uh, so a person in a wheelchair can actually get through, you know, into and out of a bathroom and use it on a minimal level. So uh, as I say, this is some of the issues uh, that we're thinking about in the future to, to work on uh, from a national point of view. Um, but for, other than that, I will wait for questions at the end and I'll return it back over to Susan at this time. Okay, thank you so much, Lee. Appreciate all that good information. And now I'm going to uh, turn to our uh, next panelist, uh, Anne Robinson, uh, to talk about the Texas chapter's successful ADA enforcement initiative uh, with the uh, state legislature. And tell us a little bit about you know how the issue arose and how you developed your strategy to go forward to the state legislature and you, the reception you received and all that good stuff. All right, hi Susan. All right, thank you Susan. I'll try to give it. So in 2017, while serving as the Texas chapter president, we were able to identify an issue with disabled parking and the lack of it, especially in areas where there was a large military populations, retired populations. Working with uh, state Senator Donna Campbell, um, we were able to identify that a well-intentioned law allowed um, disabled veterans with a 50% rating uh, of anything, it didn't matter if it was a mobility issue or not, to have free, to, to use handicap parking uh, without qualifying as all the rest of us did. So as, as a well-intentioned law, it disrupted the independence of very many people in the state of Texas. So after our initial contact with uh, Senator Campbell, 
uh, we worked with her for four years. The Texas Senate and the Texas legislature is only in session every other year. So during the off years of the, of the legislature, we provided more testimony with Senator Campbell and some of her counterparts uh, working with her staff, ensuring that it kept going forward. So fortunately, this, when the legislature opened up in 2021, um, Senator Campbell had a bill, SB 792, that she was able to introduce. And the, the several folks from the Texas chapter, we were able to provide written testimony. And for the House, um, we were able to provide video testimony via Zoom for the first time ever. So working with them, providing the testimony, uh, we were able to get the law changed. So it requires everybody in the state of Texas now who needs to use disabled parking to have the universal symbol, either on a placard or on a wheelchair uh, plate. So just a regular DV plate will not get you um, disabled parking. All those, all those people still get to keep their discounted license plates and all the other privileges that went along with them. So it's saving the spots. The governor signed the bill for us on May 21st, 24th. It goes into effect January 1st. And uh, so it's gonna open up parking spots and allow independence for a whole lot of people while saving the parking spots for those who are gonna need them in the future. Okay, all right. Well, that is uh, always good to hear those success stories uh, gives gives us hope. And now we're going to turn to Tom for uh, his discussion of what he did uh, in his hometown to advance uh, support and compliance with ADA. And it uh, interesting little kind of organic story of how this came about. So the, the mic is yours, Tom. Well, thank you, Susan. And Lee, thank you for mentioning the Minnesota Vikings earlier. Um, I was born and bred Twin Cities, um, but I had to leave the frozen tundra to, to move out to Golden, Colorado. I've been there for 25 years. And during that time, noticed a lot of things that are great and a lot of things that aren't so great regarding accessibility. Because Golden is on the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. So the terrain is pretty interesting. Yet in most areas of the businesses, it's a pretty flat area. So there's basically kind of no excuse, even though I think sometimes our city sometimes goes that way. Um, so what I decided to do was look at restaurants and, and decide um, to, to see that there are plenty of restaurants here in this town that are up on the hills and it, there's absolutely impossibility for, for someone like me to independently take my wheelchair uh, to go to, to, uh, to dine. Um, not that I'm a loner, but um, obviously we wanna make sure that anybody who wants to be independent would have the opportunity to do so. And I decided to do a different tack. There was, I noticed in the last two or three years, there were a, a, a couple of um, new owners that renovated historic buildings over a hundred years old uh, to make restaurants just really usable uh, for the disabled community. And um, I, I basically decided to, to write a blog back in April. Um, and I don't know if anyone's familiar with the Nextdoor app, but that one is a, a, a neighborhood-based app to kind of share with neighbors the good, the bad, the ugly. Sometimes it gets political. Sometimes it talks about, you know, uh, wildlife. Can you can you identify this wildlife in the area? And so I thought I'm not someone who frequently or ever uh, posts on that, but I thought this would be a great opportunity to to uh, show the positive in the uh, in in three areas uh, or three examples, I should say. And I also wanted to do this to be to carefully write it to make sure that it, there would be no backlash, but also to kind of um, just share with the community that I'm not someone who's perpetually angered or concerned. Um, so I thought it'd be nice to, to kind of show the positive. And what I want what I want to do is um, Heather, if you could show that this is about three or four paragraphs long. Back in early April, this is what I sent, um, and I'll, I'll read it real quick. To give, to give everybody a context. So I said, hi, Golden Neighbors. I often think about access throughout our city. And today I feel compelled to post for the first time ever 
about three businesses that have gone out of their way to ensure access is maximized, even in our town where space is more of a premium. So why not start with my favorite subject, food? First up is Bonfire Burritos. They took a structure and carefully thought out ramping, handicapped parking with adequate striped aisle. I have a van with a side ramp, outside seating area and created an inviting vibe. Second is Cafe 13. Talk about intentionally going above and beyond. When they renovated, all areas became more opened up inside and an improved restroom. I can place myself just about anywhere and feel like I'm not in someone else's way. They placed a subtle uh, concrete ramp in their courtyard and the patio is actually stationary small rock, even though it looks like loose gravel. A third example is the newly opened Golden Mill. Oh my. The owners are interacted with my wife over a year ago and an exclusive tour was set up to get a sneak peek before their soft opening. Uh, we brought an extra wheelchair Susan got in it and did the tour with me at my level. She pushed up ramps, took the elevator and lift. I wish I could have such access back in, in Breckenridge back in the 1990s after a day of mono skiing. How cool the business owners found unique ways to preserve historical structures and welcome not just the disabled community, but mommies and daddies with double strollers and anyone with unique needs. So these now have earned the coveted Tom and Angela access seal of approval. But there's more. After a decade of putting on pounds, that probably equates to a COVID, uh, COVID 40. I need to hit and push my manual wheelchair, the Clear Creek Trail, which has been extremely accessible for quite some time, and continues to call my name. So I said blessings to everyone, Tom. And I wanted to show this to the neighbors. And by the way, I got uh, 25 direct responses and over 200 likes for smiley faces and those types of things. And it was 100% positive. Um, and I basically wanted to show that there were some tangible ways that these business owners, in a technical way, if we were to look at all the measurements, et cetera, if the, if the slope grade per ADA was a 2%, that was the, you know, the, 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 mandate, the mandate, they exceeded that. And they made sure it was only a half an inch or an inch um, grade uh, for ramping and things like that. And that's what I've been trying to impress upon the, the city of Golden as well, because they have... Um, just like any small um, town or big big towns, they, they have ADA experts and their engineers know all that to the letter of the law. But given the terrain here, I wanted to make sure that they would intentionally attempt to exceed those basic mandates to make life a little bit easier for anybody who has to deal with those slopes, especially when there's some inclement weather. Um, so I think that was the basic things I wanted to share today uh, to add to our discussion at the local level. Great. Okay. I think uh, we're going to finish out a couple of slides here and then we'll turn to questions and answers, I think. I uh, just want to run through a couple of the resource pages we have at the end here. Um, you see on your screen the, uh, the way to find your regional ADA center there at adata.org and find your region. We also put up there the Mid Atlantic. ADA Center's uh, contact information for those of you who live in Delaware, DC, Maryland, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and West Virginia. And then I wanna point out also, thanks to the ADA network, uh, a number of fact sheets that are pertinent to today's discussions, one on accessible lodging, Another on uh, ticketing, I think there was a question in the question box about ticket sales. So there may be some material in there that uh, is relevant to that question. And then there is a uh, parking fact sheet. And on the next slide, we have more resource information. We, you heard mention the National Disability Rights Network and you can find your local protection and advocacy office at uh, ndrn.org. And down there at the bottom is uh, PVA's website where you can find some uh, interesting uh, fact sheets and uh, social media campaigns about uh, you, our honor the spot uh, effort, which is pva.org 
get involved, honor the spot, all about making sure the people who really need the parking spots have access to the parking spots. Um, there are some very cute little animations on that web page too that offer handy visual cues about or visual representations about accessibility in a number of settings. And then our ADA resources uh, fact sheets can be found at pba.org ADA. And so uh, fortunately there's contact information for Heather and Lee and myself, uh, you know where to find us with our first name, last initial and pva.org there. Then uh, I think we will get on to questions. I, I had a question for Carlene that I just wanted a clarification talking about um, the, you said 50 employees, if a, if a department has 50 employees, um, and Carlene, if you could re-up your video so we can see your lovely face. Hello. Um, you, I think you said if an entity has 50 employees, then they have to have an ADA coordinator. Does that apply to like a municipal department or does it apply overall to a, a county or a city? So that, because I know some counties and cities or counties anyway, or towns are very small and may have 50 employees overall. But uh, so would they have to have an ADA coordinator? Right, um, good question. Um, it, not necessarily, you know, um, we see this sometimes like the Pennsylvania boroughs, you know, they're small and they may not have 50 or more employees. Um, it's still strongly recommended. Um, and often um, if a town or a borough has a settlement agreement with DOJ, they may still say, yeah, you still need to have one because just because you don't have to have an assigned representative doesn't mean that you don't still have the obligation to uh, make sure that things are accessible. So it's really in their best interest um, to, have, to have somebody who helps, um, you know, with the, the uh, they call it a, a self-evaluation and transition plan where you're, you're gonna review everything for accessibility and then try to make improvements. And they oversee that. Did that help? <laughs> Thank you. Um, Heather, I, I know we have some questions, so if you want to relay them. Um. We do. Um, so thanks, Susan, and thanks again to our presenters. Um, one question we have um, that, I've, Anne, I, I'm curious if this came up in the Texas discussion, um, is a concern about, uh, in this case, the state of Pennsylvania, uh, seeming to be a little lax in the process for obtaining um, a, a hang tag or a placard, um, and then that leading to more placards than parking spaces. Uh, we know that that access to parking is, is always an issue, but is is if I know you, Texas was looking at the disabled veteran plate versus the the placard with the symbol, but was there any discussion about uh, this overall concern that you know really the the standards are a little bit too lax? The, the, this is Anne. Yes, Heather, there was just a little bit of discussion on that. It was not something that we were able to bring to the forefront on that part. Um, but I know Senator Campbell was talking about maybe tightening it up later down, down the road. Um, so we'll still be working with her office, uh, keeping in touch, the, the biggest part, but not, be, not being able to tighten those ropes up just a little bit more for the qualifying standards, so. Great, thanks, Anne. And, and we're also, uh, just so you're aware, at National as part of our Honor the Spot um, and some outreach, uh, we're, we're gonna be looking at, you know, what our state's doing um, in, in this area uh, related to parking, just to see if we can provide so, some more assistance to chapters as, as they strike out um, in the way that, that Texas chapter did in this case, um, you know, to try to improve those. Uh, a question we have for Carlene relates to um, 
door pressure. Um, so there's, you know, there's not a requirement for automatic doors um, for, for Title III, you know, for stores, things like that. Um, but there's a, a question, you know, basically, how do you measure um, that that the door is meet, not meeting the pressure? You know, you can tell yourself that maybe it's difficult to open, but how do you know that it doesn't technically meet the standard uh, before you might go through the process of trying to file a complaint? Is there anything that you can recommend? There's a little tool that you can get that measures door pressure. Um, you can get it at Home Depot. Um, and you know so it'll it'll give you that information um but something something to remember about that is um it isn't always that an automatic yeah technically an automatic door opener is not required but that doesn't mean that it may not sometimes be necessary to make the door accessible um, for example if there's a, a bathroom that has um when you open the door there's um, a really tight turn to get into the bathroom. You might actually have to have a door opener because they can't turn and hold the door open at the same time. So, um, you know, so accessibility, yeah, you can, you can measure the door pressure, but that doesn't necessarily tell you if it's really accessible or not. So that's why sometimes it's often good to have somebody who's more of an expert still, still take a look at it. Thanks, Carlene. Sure. Um, and is that something that um, ADA centers uh, can can assist individuals with? So if individuals call and you know just really aren't sure, they don't think a business meets the requirements, but they don't know how how would a, a an ADA center help an individual who, who's encountering a barrier? Sure. Good question. We don't really have um, people that can go out and do site visits or measurements. Um, we sometimes do it internally for our events, that kind of thing, but we have to be really careful not to cross over into, um, you know, being advocates. Um, so generally, we refer people either to um, consultants or centers for independent living who often have somebody on staff who can come out and do some measuring. Great. So a center for independent living might be able to help with that. Yeah. Um, we had a, a comment that, you know, we would state that the ADA is, uh, is merely a standard of compliance and state and locals can go further. Um, that's very true. ADA, as we call it, is a, is a floor, not a ceiling, uh, meaning that there's always room to rise above. So just because the ADA has a specific requirement, um, the state or local can't go below what the ADA requires, but they can always go above. Um, and so that's something uh, that as you look at whatever your state or local laws are, you know, that are applicable to the to the rights of people with disabilities, uh, you may see that the, the state law is actually a little a little better um, in some cases as far as what it requires or maybe also um, in your remedies. Uh, which which leads to our next question, which is is about one of our issues here the um, ADA notification, which is the kind of the short term we've used in recent years as, as there's been a lot of discussion about lawsuits that have been filed under under Title III. Um, and, you know, concerns there are about folks that are filing lawsuits to simply file lawsuits versus trying to get compliance. Um, in some places, the state laws allow for damages, which can make it great for people with disabilities, but also gives more incentive to sue, whereas Title III of the ADA does not allow for damages. Uh, it's just injunctive relief, which means fix the barrier. Uh, but we had a question if there was a, a trend in Congress to try to have some kind of federal, um, you know, requirement uh, beyond what some of the states are doing, uh, you know, on their, their state level. Uh, so, so Lee or Susan, could you just quickly speak to that, please? Lee is our ADA Notification Act guru sure. champion to fight it. So, sure. Um, as you mentioned, Heather, uh, ADA notification is legislation that has been introduced in the last two, three Congresses, I believe. Uh, fortunately, uh, it is a, a bit of a partisan bill. It hasn't gone forward, um, fortunately. Uh, the reality is uh, 
it's about it, what that legislation wants to do is require uh, a person with disability give formal notice to a public accommodation uh, that they're out of compliance of ADA uh, before they exercise their right to file a suit. Um, and the reality is we're 31 years after the fact that ADA has passed um, and everyone should know about ADA as a law. Um, and you just cannot, um, I mean, that's that would basically provide complete disincentive if notification passed as a, leg, as a piece of legislation for any business to automatically comply with the law, they would wait to be notified. Um, it's tough enough right now uh, to ensure uh, ADA compliance because uh, like I said, we're 31 years after the fact and, and the, be, the, the, real, the, be, the beauty about ADA is it allows a private right of action, which allows a person to exercise their right uh, to enforce the law. And the reason it does that is the Department of Justice can't do it all. Uh, the Department of Justice does still do ADA compliance cases, but on a bigger, broader, more impactful um, case. Um, such as, um, uh, I can't, you know, like a, uh, a system, like a project civic action uh, under a Title II case where they're looking at uh, a whole systemic uh, city that's out of compliance with, the, uh, with uh, their Title II requirements. So, uh, but individual cases such as a doorstep to get into a public accommodation, um, that's why you know, negotiation, mediation, uh, individual people with disabilities, you know, have the right to, to exercise uh, their right under the law to come into compliance because historically we beat our, you know, we've talked ourselves blue to that uh, business saying, hey, I'm your customer. Why don't you fix this ramp so I can come in uh, it doesn't cost that much to do it. And the reality is they just ignore us until, you know, we go away. So I'm not sure if I answered your question, but the, 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 the action is that uh, notification would be a disincentive if it passed legislatively uh, for compliance with, with the law. And I'll just use this as a commercial opportunity to point people to PVA's voter voice page because if ADA notification gets active, we that will be on our voter voice page uh, pronto. So um, not to worry, we're watching it. All right, well, thank you um, to our panelists. And I know that we've had, we have lots of questions and unfortunately we have reached um, a little bit past the end of our time. So we do have the contact information for both Susan Lee and myself. Um, on the slide here and feel free to reach out to us directly um, if we weren't able to get your question answered today. Um, there are a lot of great resources, as Susan mentioned, um, on the ADA Center's websites um, that can be of help and also on the um, PBA ADA site. Um, the webinar today was recorded and will be available on PBA's website. Um, we will also uh, provide the transcription of the webinar as well as the PowerPoint slides so that you will have access to all of that. Um, and as a registrant, you will receive that information uh, once it is available. Uh, so thank you again to everyone. Uh, again, if you didn't get your question answered today, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, we really appreciate it. And uh, this concludes the webinar and uh, we hope everyone has a good rest of your day. Thank you.